you're new to our church, I'm Ricky Powell. I'm honored to be the lead pastor here, and what a great team we have that have led us already today in worship. And now I just want to spend a few minutes as we think about God's Word and what it means to each one of us in our personal lives. So welcome. At the end of our service, I'll be standing right here at the front, and I'd love to greet our guests today. Or if you're taking a next step in your spiritual decision or your walk with Christ, I'd love to help you in any way that I can. And of course, Pastor Matt and our volunteers will be at the back at your what is your next step area. You know, as a pastor, I hear a lot of bad news. We live in a broken world, and there are a lot of broken lives and broken relationships, and, and often it can be overwhelming. That's why I love it when I hear good news. I love getting good news at times. Sometimes the good news is when you call me and tell me that you guys are expecting your first child, and you're excited, and I get excited for you. Or sometimes people will call me and say, man, I got a raise, or I took a new job that's going to help me lead and care for my family. Sometimes I hear the good news that you are cancer-free, no more radiation, no more chemotherapy treatments, and you are celebrating that good news. I love hearing good news. And really, bad news makes the good news even sweeter. And we live in a world that needs some good news. You turn on the news, and you see all the bad and the evil of our world. We're still praying for our our brothers and sisters in Christ in Ukraine and our missionaries who were serving there. And of course, the innocent people of Ukraine who were suffering greatly at the hands of uh, evil. There's just no other word for it. Evil that is being perpetrated on them by Putin and Russia. And so we hear a lot of bad news. We see a lot of bad news on television or on the internet. And then, of course, we often have to deal with bad news in our own lives. Uh, we, we see the brokenness of our world come home and hit personal with us, broken relationships and friendships or broken bodies, and we struggle sometimes with our own brokenness, and it can get overwhelming. But sometimes the bad news makes the good news even sweeter, because then when you hear the good news, it lifts your spirits. And I, I'm going to tell you this morning something that you probably already know if you've been around church for any length of time. The best news is the good news. And what I mean by good news is the good news of Jesus Christ. The gospel is what it's called. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news that is the best news that this world needs to hear, that I personally need to hear, that you need to hear, because with Jesus, everything else falls into place. When we know him as our personal Lord and Savior, we can have the peace of God We can have forgiveness of our sin. We can recognize that God is in control even when we don't understand it. We can know that he loves us and great is his faithfulness to each one of us. But the bad news is without Christ, we have to face all the brokenness and the hurt of our world alone. And we suffer alone. And as followers of Jesus, it is our honor and our privilege to not only receive the good news of Jesus in our own lives, but also to share this good news with other people in our lives. The gospel of Jesus is too good to keep to ourselves. If we go to a theater and we see a great movie, we don't mind telling somebody about it. We've got good news. Or if the preacher lets you out a little early one Sunday, man, we tell people this good news. And then the second service gets their hopes up, and I never let them out on time. (laughs) I don't have that pressure. So we we know instinctively that good news is too good to keep to ourselves, and we want to share it. But Lifeway Christian Research did a study uh, just a, a while ago where they asked committed followers of Jesus, do you believe it is your personal responsibility to share the gospel with other people? And 80% of Christians said, it is my personal responsibility to share the good news of Jesus with other people. But in that same survey, they asked people in the last six months, how many of you have actually done that? How many of you have actually shared the good news of Jesus with another person? And 61% had to say, I have not shared my faith in Jesus with another person in the last six months. And if we're like the average church, that means 61% of us have not shared our faith in Jesus with another person. We've not told another person the good news that there is a God who loves you, who sent his son Jesus into the world to live a perfect life where we couldn't and we haven't. And he offered that perfect life in exchange for our sin when he died on the cross. 
He was buried, but on the third day he rose from the dead and he's alive, ready to forgive all who will trust in him and give them the gift of eternal life. That's good news. But so often we're keeping it to ourselves. So as we begin this new series called Broken, I want us to think about how to prepare our hearts for Easter, to not only celebrate the risen Lord and Savior Jesus in our own lives, I want us to prepare for Easter because people are open to an invitation to a church service on Easter, almost like any other time of the year, and people are more open to a conversation about Jesus around the Easter time than almost any other time of the year. And it's my prayer that I will be found faithful and you'll be found faithful to actually share the good news of Jesus with other people. But often when we think about sharing the, the gospel of Jesus, we, we get a little nervous. We have this idea that I've got to get a bullhorn and stand on a street corner and I've got to confront people. But we're going to see today that the gospel is more about conversations than confrontations. We're going to see today as we take our Bibles and turn to Colossians chapter 4, beginning with verse 2, that we have the privilege, those of us who were inside the church, we have the privilege and a burden of sharing the gospel with those who were outside the faith of Jesus Christ. And so as we think about this burden and this passion and this opportunity for those of us who were inside the faith to reach those who were outside the faith, we need to make sure we're doing it well It's not about confrontation. It's about conversations with the people in our lives. One of the things that you can do is when people express to you uh, something about brokenness in their own lives or brokenness in our world, is you can take that as an opportunity to point people to Jesus. In fact, maybe what we'll talk about today, you'll say, you know, I heard something one day from a person, and it really helped me. Can I take a moment and just share it with you? And at the end of our service today, I'm going to give you a simple way to turn everyday conversations into gospel conversations. Very practical, so hang in there with me. But why don't we take our Bibles, first of all, and go to uh, Colossians chapter 4, beginning with verse 2. And I want to give you three keys to effectively sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with other people. The Apostle Paul, as you know, was once a persecutor of Christians in the first century. He did not believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, and he made it his life's ambition to stamp out Christianity in those early days of the faith. But one day, as he was on his way to Damascus in Syria, he had an encounter with the living, risen Christ, changed his life. And he went from being a murderer to the greatest missionary the church has ever known. He went from being a persecutor of the faith to a preacher of the gospel of Jesus. He went around the Roman Empire sharing Jesus, reaching people for Jesus, planting churches, and strengthening those churches by writing letters to those churches, many of which we have contained in the New Testament. In fact, the book of Colossians that we're reading today is actually a letter. It's a letter that he wrote from a prison cell to the churches in the city of Colossae in about A.D. 60 or A.D. 61. And he's writing this letter to encourage them, stay true to Jesus, stay true to the gospel, and keep reaching your city with the good news of Jesus. Now, before you think bad of Paul, he's not in prison because he did anything wrong. He's in prison because he did everything right. It wasn't always popular to be a Christian. It wasn't always easy to be a Christian. You could land in jail by the Roman Empire if you were a Christian, and that's why Paul's there. He's there because he's preaching the gospel. By the way, in God Blessed America, let us remember that there are billions of Christians around the world who put their lives on the line for the faith of Jesus Christ every single day. Don't take the freedoms that we enjoy for granted. So just like Paul suffered, there are Christians today who are suffering for the faith of Jesus Christ. So he's writing this letter, and he wants to help them, among other things, to know how to effectively share Jesus with those outside the faith of Jesus. He doesn't call them three keys, but I'm going to. So let me give you the first key that I think Paul would tell us about this morning. If you want to reach people, first of all, pray passionately. Pray passionately. If you want to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's a good place to start by talking to God about people before you talk to people about God. Pray passionately. Here's where I get that. 
Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, Paul writes, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Now let's pause there for a moment. He says, continue steadfastly in prayer. Paul assumes we are people of prayer. Prayer is talking with God. Prayer is communicating with God. Prayer is a conversation with God. Not only did Paul assume we will be men and women who pray if we are followers of Jesus, Jesus assumed we would be people of prayer. He said, my father's house shall be a house of prayer. He said, when you pray, pray like this, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And he gave us what we call the Lord's Prayer. And Jesus, who never taught his disciples how to preach, taught them how to pray. And so Paul picks up on that and he says, continue in prayer and continue steadfastly. Don't give up. Don't stop praying. Let prayer not be the last resort. Let it be the first resort of your life. Find opportunities to talk to God about whatever it is you're living with and dealing with and facing and questioning and wrestling with. Bring it to God in prayer. And this also includes bringing to God in prayer the, the desire to share our faith with other people. God, I want to do this, but I need your help to do this. I need you to help me do this. I need you to give me opportunities to do this. I need you to open my mouth when the time comes. I need you to help me remember what to say when the time comes for the person I'm talking to. Pray about this. Continue steadfastly in prayer. And he says, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Literally, be alert. Keep your eyes open. I don't think he means just stay awake during your prayer time. That's, that's good. That's good advice. Try to stay awake when you're talking to God. I think that's probably a good thing to do. But you know how it is. Maybe right now this morning, you're having to tell yourself, stay awake. You know, the preacher's preaching. Keep listening. Lean in. Hang in there. It'll be over soon. So, but I don't think he's just talking about staying physically awake. I think he's talking about staying spiritually alert to what we ought to pray about, that we ought to be watchful in prayer. God, what is it that I need to pray about? And you ought to be watching for opportunities that God would give you to share the gospel of Jesus. That's why Paul says in verse 3, he writes, at the same time, so while you're praying, at the same time, pray also for us. Paul's referring to himself. He's referring to his uh, partner in missions, Timothy, um, he's talking about the other missionaries who were helping him. So at the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word. The word is, is the gospel. To declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. And then he writes in verse 4 that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Paul, the greatest missionary the church has ever known, the Billy Graham of his day, was not too high and mighty to humble himself and say, church, I need your prayers. I need your prayers that I'll be faithful to share the gospel, that I'll be faithful to take advantage of the opportunities God gives me to share Jesus, and that when I do have the opportunity to share the gospel, I'll make it plain. I won't muddle the message. I won't get off on a tangent, but I'll stay laser focused on Christ and him crucified, buried, and resurrected. If Paul needed to pray and needed other people praying for him to be effective in evangelism, how much more do you think we ought to be praying for each other and praying for ourselves? Pray, he says. Pray passionately. Pray for open doors of opportunity to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, some people would say, we can give Paul a pass. He doesn't need to worry about sharing the gospel. The poor man is in prison. I mean, this is just not a good time for him. You know, he, he, he needs to focus on making sure he's going to live to see another day. He can worry about witnessing to other people later, but he's in prison. We're going to give him a pass. But Paul says, don't give me a pass. Pray for me that even in my chains, I will be found faithful to share Jesus. And the reason I bring that out is because in my life, the tendency sometimes is I know I need to be telling other people about Jesus. And when things are better in my life, I will. When I'm not so busy, I will. When I'm not worried about my finances, I will. When I'm not worried about my health issues, I will. But there's no excuse to not be sharing the gospel. In fact, God may use our pain 
as a platform from which we can tell someone else about Jesus. You know, Paul wrote other letters. One of the letters that we have, he wrote, he wrote to Christians in the ancient city of Philippi. We call it the book of Philippians. And in Philippians, he's in the same prison. This is the same time period. And he tells the Christians in Philippi, I want you to know that what's happened to me, ending up here persecuted and in chains and not sure if I'm going to live to see another day, has actually helped me further the gospel of Jesus. You see, Paul was, was chained to a Roman centurion every moment of every day. They would change shifts after so many hours, and Paul in prison, chained to a Roman centurion, and you could only imagine him thinking, I've got a captive audience. I'm not the captive here. This Roman soldier's the captive here. He can't go anywhere, so I'm going to talk to him. Hey, have you ever heard about Jesus of Nazareth? So much to the point that he told the Philippians, the gospel of Jesus Christ has reached some Roman centurions. The gospel has even reached Caesar's own household. Some of Caesar's own family has heard about Jesus and they've come to faith in Christ. Isn't that amazing? Listen, God may put you flat on your back in a hospital room because it could be a nurse that needs to hear about Jesus. God could put you in that terrible situation at work because your coworker needs to see a life on fire for Jesus and they need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. God may put you in that recovery program not only because you are breaking free from addictions, but somebody else needs to know the name of the higher power you're looking for is Jesus Christ. God wants to use your pain as a platform for the gospel of Jesus. And Paul says, hey, while you're praying for yourself, pray for me too. Pray for Timothy. Timothy as well. I almost called him Timmy. Uh, pray for Timmy as well. See, we're real close, Timothy and I. So pray passionately. Before you talk to people about God, talk to God about people. Second key to effective evangelism, live wisely. Not only should you pray passionately, you need to live wisely. I'll never forget this, and I don't want to embarrass him. I don't know if he's in this service or be in the next one, but my son Joshua, he plays bass guitar on stage here. When he was little, I was driving him somewhere. And I'll never forget, we were at the intersection of Hodges Boulevard and Atlantic Boulevard. You know, there's a red light there. And I was about to turn left, and someone came across the lane and cut me off. And so I slammed on brakes to not hit this person. And as soon as I did, without me saying a word, I heard that little boy's voice in the back seat, idiot. <laughs> and I went home and, and reprimanded Donna for teaching him <laughs> those words. No, when I heard him say idiot, I knew immediately where he had heard that from. He had heard it from me at other times in traffic. And I realized I've got to watch myself. I've got to be careful what I say and what I do because I've got little eyes that are watching me, little ears that are listening to me. And friend, that's also true when it comes to those who are outside the faith of Jesus Christ. They are watching those of us who claim to have a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus. They're watching what we do. They're listening to what we say. And often, we're not living wisely and we're actually hurting our Christian witness. Some of the stuff that we post on social media is actually hurting our witness as Christians. I don't mean speak up for the truth. I'm not saying don't speak up for the truth. I'm saying sometimes the way we treat other people and the way we, we demean other people behind the keyboard that we would never do face to face and we wonder why people don't believe the gospel message or the way they see us fighting and arguing with each other. Do you really think that those outside the faith will believe our message of reconciliation with God if we're not even reconciled with one another? This world will not believe the authenticity of the gospel message until they see the reality of our love for God and love for other people. Amen. They've got to see it, and we've got to live wisely. Paul puts it this way, Colossians 4, verse 5, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. He's talking about outsiders to the faith. This is not a derogatory term, 
outsiders. He's saying we're inside a relationship with God. We're inside the family of God. We're inside of the forgiveness and love of God. But there are many people who have yet to be reached with the gospel, and they're outside of the faith. They're outside of hope. They're outside of forgiveness. They're outside of the body of Christ. And we need to walk in wisdom. We need to conduct ourselves wisely as we live amidst outsiders because they're watching. And one of the ways to live wisely is not just watching what you do and what you say and how you live your life, but also by making best use of the time. Your time is limited. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. We don't know what that day is, but the day is coming that all of us are going to breathe our last breath. And we better redeem the time. We better buy it back and make it work for us rather than us working for it. We need to be focused and intentional because time is short. The same is true for this church. This church has this moment. We're not promised tomorrow. We've got to make, take advantage of every opportunity we have as a church to be passionately focused and united on reaching the spiritually lost in this community. But friend, it's not only true that your time and my time is limited on this earth. The time of our unsaved Christian family members and co-workers and friends and neighbors is also limited. We need to take advantage of the time God has given us to share the gospel. You can't be responsible for their decision and their response to the gospel, but I don't want anyone in my family to die and spend eternity separated from God in hell because Ricky didn't take advantage of an opportunity to share the good news of Jesus with them. We've got to walk and live wisely. And then finally, number three, the third key, speak appropriately. Speak appropriately. You've probably heard that quote attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Most scholars and historians say there's no evidence that St. Francis of Assisi ever uttered those words. Somehow they got attached to him. And I understand the sentiment of those words. It stresses the importance of living wisely among people outside the faith. Preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. But that's where the statement fails. It is always necessary to speak words. It is not the good news of Jesus if it's just your life people are seeing. I'm sorry, I love you and I know you love me and we want to love God and love other people and do good deeds, but you and I will never be able to live good enough to get one single person out of hell into heaven. There's only one life that can make that possible, and his name is Jesus. And we have to open our mouths and share the gospel of his death, burial, and resurrection and the call to repent and to believe. He's the only one that can save people. And we've got to speak up. We can't just let our good deeds do all the work. We've got to back up our deeds with the declaration of the gospel of Jesus. Paul puts it this way in verse 6. Let your speech... Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Let your words be a gracious gift, people, as they hear about Jesus. It's not about confrontation. It's about a conversation. It's about your words being a gift to people. Let your words always be gracious. And he says, seasoned with salt. Salt in the ancient days served as a preservative of meat, and it also served to add flavor to food. And Paul is saying, let all of your conversations be flavored with the love and the good news of Jesus, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Everybody's different. Everybody's going to have a different question about Jesus. Everybody's going to have a different starting point. And you need to be ready when that opportunity comes to share the gospel, to point people to Jesus. That's the good news of Jesus. In fact, what I thought we would do today is, is to take you to a little tool that will help you learn how to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's called Three Circles. Some of you have seen this before. But how many times in your everyday life do people bring up ideas and questions and concerns about brokenness? 
They talk about broken lives or broken marriages or their financial situation. They, they, they bring up all those problems and challenges in everyday conversation. It's amazing how many times people will discuss their heartaches with you or their struggles with their marriage, with their children, what have you. And in that moment where people are hurting, we can give them hope. And his name is Jesus. So we're going to give you a little guide, three circles. If you can draw three circles, you, <laughs> you can share the gospel of Jesus. In fact, when you came in, you probably noticed in your uh, seat uh, a sheet of paper. Um, and that sheet of paper is there for you to draw these three circles. Well, there's my sheet. Did you see that in your seat? And if you're at home watching this, just take a sheet of paper. And if you can draw three circles... You can share the gospel. Draw that first circle because sometimes a person will talk to you about their brokenness. Inside of that circle, you can write the words God's design. They're talking to you about their brokenness, their pain, their hurts, their, their hang-ups, and their struggles. And you can use that as an opportunity to say, listen, I feel your pain. No, don't say that. Um, uh, you could say to them, you know, I once heard someone share some things that brought me hope in the midst of my brokenness. Could I take a moment and share that with you? And then take out a napkin, take out a piece of paper, whatever you have, and draw a circle and write God's design. You could say something like this as you draw that. You know, we live in a broken world, but it wasn't always that way. In fact, the Bible teaches that when God created the world, he said it was very good. Everything in it and everyone in it lived in harmony with God and harmony with one another. It was literally like heaven on earth. It was beautiful. And that was God's original intention. In fact, he created us people to live on purpose, to know him, to worship him, to love him, and to love other people created in his image. But I don't know about you, but in my life, I sometimes don't want to live according to God's design. I don't want God to be the boss. I don't want to live according to his rules. I want to do my own thing. I want to go out and disobey God, and I want to to follow my heart rather than to follow God's will. And the Bible calls that sin. When we depart from God's design, it's called sin. We're missing the mark of what God wanted for us to love him and to love others. And because of our sin, that's why we see so much brokenness in the world. That's your second circle, by the way. And as you draw that second circle, you can talk about, that's why we have broken marriages and we have broken lives and bodies. We have broken political systems. We have a broken environment. It's because sin came into the world and we are separated from God and from the purpose he has for us. And often in our brokenness, we know something's wrong and we try to fix it. So we, we try all of these different avenues. And then you could draw those little squiggly arrows. You know, we'll try relationships or we'll try drugs or we'll try sex or we'll try money and we'll try careers, all trying to fix what's broken. But we discover we can't do it ourselves. If we're going to ever be fixed and if this world's ever going to be fixed, we can't do it. We need someone else who can come and rescue us. We need good news. And that's when you draw the third circle. That's the good news. That's the gospel. The good news is, even though we've sinned and we've departed from God, he still loves us. In fact, Jesus said in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So no matter who you are, what you've done, God loves you. He sent Jesus on a rescue mission. You see, Jesus did for us what we couldn't do ourselves. He came into this world and he's the only one who ever perfectly lived according to God's design. He loved God with all of his heart, mind, soul, strength. He loved his neighbor as himself and he never sinned. And he exchanged his perfect life on the cross of Calvary as payment for our sin. He took our punishment and shame. And having died, he rose from the dead. And if you will simply put your trust and believe in him, you can be forgiven of your sin. That's the good news. That's the gospel. But it's not enough to just know this. Jesus calls us to repent and to believe in him. And that's when you draw the little arrow that says from the gospel, to the gospel, repent and believe. Repent means I turn away from my sin and I turn to Jesus. Jesus, I need you. I want you in my life. And we believe in him. We put our confidence in him. We put our trust in him and in the gospel of Jesus. 
And when we trust Jesus as Savior, our sins are forgiven. We're given the gift of eternal life. And now we're able to recover and pursue God's purpose for our lives. No, we're not going to be perfect this side of heaven. But now through the presence of Christ in our lives, we can recover God's purpose for our lives in loving him and loving others. And we can pursue living for Christ through his strength. And once you've done that, you can say, friend, I trusted Jesus as my Savior. Would you like to do that? And if a person says yes, share with them a simple prayer that they can pray. There's no sinner's prayer in the Bible. Uh, you know, you got the, the, the guy in the temple saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. But the Bible does say that if we confess with our mouth our sins and believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, we'll be saved. So maybe you'll lead them in a little prayer. Dear God, I admit to you I'm a sinner. I've strayed from your design, but thank you for loving me. I believe in Jesus. Today, I trust in him and him alone to forgive me of my sin, to give me the gift of eternal life through his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, if your friend says, I'm not ready for that, say, that's okay. Just know I'm praying for you. And if you want to talk more, I'd love to talk to you more. And just keep that door open. Maybe, maybe tonight what you'll do is you'll, you'll meet with a friend Maybe it's your sister, maybe it's your brother, maybe it's a coworker, or somebody you're going to be hanging out with tonight. Maybe you'll say, you know, I heard something this morning that helped me out. I wonder, can I practice on you? And you can practice the three circles with them and share the gospel with that person. I did that a few years ago, and uh, I challenged our church members to go home and practice on someone. And one of our church members called me the next morning, and she said, I called my sister. And I said, I want to practice my homework my preacher gave me today. And she said, my sister accepted Jesus as Savior on the phone tonight. So who knows, maybe you'll do that. If you want to know more about these three circles, you can download a free app on any app store. It's called um, Three Circles Life Conversation Guide. But I hope that'll help you out. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I hope that today's done a couple of things. First of all, you understand now why we who are followers of Jesus want you to follow him as well. It's not that we're judging you or trying to pressure you. It is we have good news and it's too good to keep to ourselves. In fact, it's a sign of our love for you that we invited you here or that we share the gospel. We, we don't want to be confrontational. We want to be conversational and tell you about Jesus. So maybe that'll help you understand why Christians are so passionate about telling other people what they believe. It's because we believe it's good news. And today, if you've just heard this gospel and you want to receive Christ, guess what? You could do it right here today. You don't have to walk down this aisle. You don't have to say anything in front of this church. Right where you sit, you can do business with God. Or right where you are at home, you can do business with God and say, Dear God, I admit to you I'm a sinner. I believe in Jesus who died for me, who was buried, who rose from the dead on the third day. I confess my sin. I put my trust in him. I receive this gift of eternal life. And the Bible says, Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't that good news? And if you've prayed to receive Christ, let me know that. Leave a comment on Facebook or YouTube. If you're in the room, uh, go talk to Matt at the back or I'll be right here at the front and let us know that you've just made that decision. And if we can help you take your next step, we would love to do just that. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this reminder today that you have called us to live on mission and that for those of us who were inside the church ought to be concerned about sharing the good news of Jesus with those who were outside. And thank you for this reminder of how we can do that. But God, we desperately depend upon you and your Holy Spirit to help us have open doors, to make it clear when we have the opportunity, to share the gospel and then leave the results with you. We'll rejoice, God, in what you do in the lives of those who hear about Jesus. I know right now you've got a name on some of our hearts of someone far from you, and we want them to be saved. Help us to take that next step and be intentional in praying, in living, and in sharing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.